Well, live from the Emerald City in Seattle, Washington, the UFO, Bigfoot, and Paranormal Hotspot of the Pacific Northwest coming directly to you, listening in around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Sunday. I'm your host, Michael W. Hall, the Paranormal Lawyer, occupying the captain's chair tonight for SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show, including... All of our listeners on the digital side at Revolution Radio. And don't forget, you can always find our archive shows for free at youtube.com forward slash based out radio. Just do us all a favor and hit that subscribe button. Our website, of course, is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to some Bumblefoot shopping at our Spaced Out Radio store and catching up on an SOR Newswire and so much more. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make us make the world 10% happier by donating to Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. And tonight, folks, we are going to have a real interesting show of Chock Full of interesting information. Tonight, we have uh, Matt Adams joining us for a discussion of the enigmatic stone chambers of the Northeast United States. Much of our discussions tonight will focus on Matt's recent study of a previously undocumented chamber that was recently discovered and whether it is a late contact structure or an earlier colonial building. If it's colonial, are the celestial uh, alignments it displays accidental or or incidental? And we we will also examine some of Matt's other investigations in New York and the New England area. And what about these sites that holds an interest for him as well as why they generate such an awe-inspiring research project for today's uh, researchers? Matt will review his research methods and other conclusions from his investigations, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Matt Adams to Spaced Out Sunday. Hey, Matt, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, this is my pleasure. This is going to be fun for all of us tonight, and let me see if I can get you. There we go. We're going to get you on full screen so everybody can see what a cool picture that is there. Very nice. What's, uh, always nice to ask, what's your, what's your hat say at the top? Because we can't see the... Uh, oh, there we go. Very hey, nice. Hey. Kennebunkport. Oh, nice. Uh, that's pretty much where you're located up there in uh, the Northeast, right? Yeah, I'm hailing out of Boston tonight. Awesome. Um, now, of course, uh, uh, this is September 13th, 2020. This happens to be my birthday. I just wanted to tell you that, so... Th- Thank you for joining me on my special day tonight. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but what's the weather like out there in the Boston area? Because out here in the Seattle, we are choked with this, the smoke from the Oregon fires. Yeah, sorry about all that. Um, weather here in Boston is a little windy, a little cool. September has taken over. Uh, I would be broadcasting from my rooftop if the wind was cooperating, but unfortunately... We get a nice lobster trap here. We are in we are in Boston, so we do the seafood thing. It seems to be a thing. Oh wow! So you have uh, literally like a, a rooftop uh, podcasting station? Is that what you call it? Yeah, I got a nice fireplace out there. Some Christmas lights wrapped around the chimney. It's a fun spot. Oh, wonderful! Oh, I love those kinds of things. Uh, I don't know if you can see my my paranormal law office here uh, down in the bunker. Of my spot of my uh, house, but um, uh, one of these days we'll have to come back and uh, join you up on your uh, your rooftop perch. It sounds kind of uh, kind of fun up there. Well, uh, you can see the whole skyline of Boston from there. It's great. Oh, oh really? Can you see uh, the city lights and stuff? Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. Oh, that w- wouldn't that be interesting? Because you know, I'm really into uh, the paranormal and UFOs. Wouldn't it be fun if we were? broadcasting and saw something pretty weird and unique because there's lots of stuff uh, that's going on as you well know in the boston area as far as sighting reports well logan airport is pretty busy and we're just outside the no fly zone 
So I'm a drone pilot. That's about the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Oh, wonderful. Now, by the way, before we get into all these details, you see, you know, as I learn things about you, uh, I always like to follow up on those kinds of things because I know that becoming an FAA certified drone pilot is not the easiest thing in the world to do. Uh, there is literally a pilot's license that you have to obtain to get one, right? If you want to do commercial work, yes. But I've opted not to go the commercial work route with it. Um, I don't believe my rights come from the government. So licenses are uh, yeah. for you versus Pennsylvania. The government can't uh, can't license anything that's a right of the people. There you go. Yeah, I, I totally uh, understand that for sure. So indeed, uh, there are certain, I, sir, I, I would imagine, self-imposed restrictions that you kind of follow just to make sure that you're going to, you're not going to, I mean, did you, by the way, here in L.A., this jetpack guy coming into the airport and uh, wreaking havoc with two separate commercial flights, pilots saying, hey, we just saw a jetpack guy at 3,000 feet coming into LAX. I couldn't believe that. That's insanity. See, that's the kind of irresponsible thing that, you know, if you feel the way I do about your rights, you have to make responsible decisions. So that guy, reckless, no, no defense. No, I mean, uh, and by the way, this guy supposedly uh, was uh, not only at about 3,000 feet, they say, the pilots were saying that, he was about uh, 3,000 feet from their craft at the same time. Um, I mean, I can't imagine getting in a jetpack and getting into the wash of a commercial airliner, and uh, there's no way you could survive that. That's crazy on his own there. I know. Got a death wish. And his first name wouldn't happen to be Tony, would it? <laughs> you know, no one uh, has been able to determine where the guy came from. No, but two separate commercial pilots confirmed uh, the same sighting at the same time in two different locations coming in on approach to LAX. Uh, so, yeah, dude, what do you got about a Tony? Do you know anything, somebody like that? Yeah, Tony Stark, Iron Man. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah, now you're talking. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Anyway, um, my gosh. Tell us a little bit about uh, how you got initially started in the idea uh, that this was, I mean, I have seen your videos on YouTube. I have seen your investigations and stuff. And literally, uh, I mean, uh, you're a big guy. You literally can get into small places that I have, I would be trepidatious into wiggling into. I know it's difficult to get there, but uh, it's almost like, uh, speed lunking what you do in some cases uh, but how did you get interested in the first place was this something you grew up with in that area or what so it's a bit of a, a bit of a story but um, we've got plenty of time tonight don't we you and I, you and I uh, got till midnight this is going to be fun awesome so there was a local sheriff of Essex County Massachusetts and that's where Salem is everybody knows Salem Massachusetts of infamous witch trials. Well, the sheriff, Robert Ellis Cahill, had collected stories over his career as sheriff and had compiled folders, and when the folder got big enough, he would write a book about it. Well, he had written about all different kinds of New England history, and he got to a point where he had the next idea for a book, I don't know whether it was 13 or 14 in a series of 27 or however many, so he puts this book together, and he got pretty much all of his information from uh, Mr. Jim Whittle, who was probably that area. And Mr. Jim Whittle had been uh, with this organization called NERA, the New England Antiquities Research Association, and he was also uh, the founder of the Early Sites Research Association, or Something like that. I can't remember the exact name of his, but anyway, so so Jim and Robert got together, and, and Jim gave all of this information to Robert, and Robert put the book together, and eventually that book was sold in a wax museum that, that Mr. Alice Cahill here had, had founded, and 
years later, I'd come across the book, taking my kids to the wax museum, something to do when they were little, and turning the little spindle around, I saw the book, and I was like, my God, ancient mysteries of New England, like, this is the one, you know, it's just like, that's it. So I picked up the book, started flipping through it, head blows up, best six bucks I ever spent, uh, get home, read the book, now, here I am, like, 13, 14 years later after that, and I want to add some perspective to my takeaways from that book. I can't say everything in there was, um, you know, the ideas that were presented, I can't say that I, I still endorse them today. I did for a long while, and the ideas that were there, I, they came from the, the first generation of researchers, the people who first started looking at this. They didn't have internet. They didn't have anything really to go by. And a lot of this was missing history. So, so many ideas there were speculation and, and things of that nature. So, I spent a good deal of time believing those theories. And then about three years ago, I started to really get into it. I started a project with my son. You know, we... I had moved in 2016 and spent all summer doing that. 2017, I'm just like, I want to get out. I want to go do something. So I spent some time out in the in the field, going to these places just for fun with my kids. And uh, my son, my oldest son Matt, he uh, took a liking to this stuff, and he also was taking a, an interest in, in video production. And I had been involved in video production since God, I was like 16. So I got him involved in that when he was young, and then the, the and we just we felt like there was an energy there. We were connecting with people, and and they wanted to help us with the project. And I put together a trailer, just something for fun, you know, and and put it together with some music. And the two of us, when we watched the finished, like, two-minute intro, we just had, like, tears of joy rolling down our cheeks because the, the, we knew we were on to something, that the feeling and the power was there, and we were just like, I, we can't believe this, this energy, what we're feeling. So um, kept going out, kept going to more sites and meeting more people and... and uh, my son has since dropped off the project, and I've chosen to continue to take it on. And at this point, I've gone to about 170-plus different sites, everywhere from Pennsylvania to Maine and everything in between. And I've been in all kinds of different hard-to-get-into places, as you've seen, and had some issues getting out of some ones. But uh, the tightest one I ever got into was probably a couple of weeks ago up in... Uh, Central, North Central Massachusetts. Uh, about a foot and a half wide, and I had to squeeze my chubby self in there. And uh, that was uh, that was the one where you had to literally stop and rest to get out of. I I, I, I remember that, and uh, of course your your buddies are sitting there. Okay, do you want us just to pull? You know, and of course. You know that's gonna that's gonna rack out your back because you literally you've got like uh, tons of stones on top of your neck, you know, trying to get out of this thing. That was uh, quite a quite a harrowing experience. It's just for us watching you. Well, the story behind that one that you're talking about was uh, 2018 up in Vermont, and we had hiked a site that was very well written about in a book called Manitou. We had hiked Cal One. And Cal 1 is a very, very tough hike. It's a very tough place to be. And that was at the, that, that what you saw was filmed at the end of the day. And I was, my whole body was just beat. And the, the, the entrance, the stone opening in this chamber is, the rocks are like this. So when you're, when you're gut and you drop down to the bottom of it, you're here. So if they start pulling me out, they're just going to wedge me into this into this little space. And the reason I couldn't get out is because my feet were dead tired, and I couldn't lift myself up. Of course, you've got it dips inside, right? So yeah. 
your whole the whole back half of you just drops out. Yeah. It's not flat. You can't just you know scurry yeah. out. It was it was as if you were beginning birth, uh, as you mentioned in the video, uh, yeah. coming out of this uh, stone precipice. I won't say what it was, but yeah, there you go. And uh, oh, it was it was pretty scary. Then of course you also had. What I could, uh, saw, I don't know if, if you agree with me, but it almost looked as if there were some megalithic uh, structures on the outside, just outside the opening, that literally were summer or winter equinox um, needles or some kinds of, uh, you know, markings that were blocking your way to begin with. I mean, this wasn't like a straight shot to get out. That was a fascinating experience for you. Yeah, so the opening, the entrance there, it's pretty small, it's roundish, and it's not very big. A lot of the ones that are around have larger openings. That one in particular is pretty small. And when you're in the inside of it and you look out and you've got a certain instrument um, that I have on my phone, it tells you where the equinox sunsets are, uh, equinox and solstice. So from the entrance of that, we determine that, yes, there is a... a an alignment to the sun there. Now, whether that's coincidental or not, that's the question. Just because we take that reading doesn't mean that we've cracked the puzzle. It just means, well, that's there, but how else can we prove that this was built for a particular purpose? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, you check, you tick them off. You go through the research. You uh, make the measurements. And... Uh, and basically, um, it's amazing what you find. I mean, these are structures that I don't know how they even were made. The stones are huge. Yeah, they are pretty large. And that one in particular, it has a circular capstone that has to weigh two to four tons. It's just huge. It's several feet across in every direction, and it caps on top of stones that are stacked up circular that come up like this, and then that weight just holds all the other stones down and in place. And of course, it's surrounded by earth, so that helps maintain the more weight and keeps the shape, but uh, they are pretty impressive. Well, and when I remember you being inside that with your cameras and your gear and your other researchers, I was amazed how dry it was inside there. Yeah, it's so dry, actually, that some of the, the dirt that's inside is actually dusty. And it comes up and, and causes what some folks like to think are orbs on the camera. But if you're a photographer like I am and you've been interested in photography for quite a long time, you want to roll. Okay, reconnecting here. Don't worry. Hopefully, we'll. Doesn't help their cause at all. Okay, Matt, I just want to let you know uh, that we just had a poor connection drop off there for about, uh, oh, about 45 seconds. <clears throat> but um, we're going to continue on. I'm not going to, like, uh, try to do anything because I think it corrects itself pretty much. We got you back on live now. Okay, I mean, if you want me to repeat what I said, I'm fine with that. Yeah, why don't you just go back about 30 seconds? All right. So I started off talking about how it was so dry inside that the dirt is, is dusty and it kicks up and we catch it on camera. Um, some people like to think of as that dust as orbs, and, and they go down that line, and that's what they believe. But I've been a photographer for quite a long time now, and when you know how a camera operates and you know how... Um, things like that function and you catch them on camera, you know, that kind of makes sense to you. But even, prof I, I'm not a professional orb researcher or anything, and I don't know if there's such a thing as a professional, but there are people that do it and take it quite seriously, and I'm fine with that. But even those kind of people want to rule out things like dust and insects and the common, um, the common sources of, of you know, these anomalies, but yeah, it was pretty dry in there. <clears throat> yeah, no, I totally agree with you in that regard. 
uh, as far as the paranormal research goes to orbs and different phenomena, you know, because it, it all kind of like melds together sometimes when you're doing something like this. Uh, I have a group called the uh, the UFO I team that does not just UFOs, but we're pretty familiar with some of those uh, orb sightings that people have. And of course, we have technical uh, scientists on our team that tell us as well that a lot of this is refractions, you know, from uh, the, the lenses and those kinds of things. So we try to eliminate all of that stuff. I know you're doing the same scrutiny out there when you're uh, doing your research, but it is fascinating uh, that uh, these structures that you run across uh, in your own neck of the woods, uh, isn't it weird that sometimes you look around you as a researcher at one point and you realize, wait a minute, I find myself in the exact same spot that I really need to be in to do some research that I never really thought of until a certain time in my lifetime. And now I'm uh, at ground zero on something I'm really interested in. I bet that feels good. Yeah, you know, sometimes I feel like Indiana Jones, honest to God. I'll, I'll find something and I'll realize, you know, when is the last human being that looked at this and knew what it was and knew that there was an alignment here? It, it had to have been hundreds of years ago, at least. So, yeah, sometimes that does feel pretty good. But I, I want to backtrack for a second here. You talked about the, the criteria, um, you know, the list of things that you have to run through in order to figure out what something is. I'm trying to make that list longer and longer and longer and longer. The longer I make that list, the more that each site in particular or, or one structure at a site, the more that passes through each of those lists, the better we can determine what it actually is and, and very likely who built it. You know, I really like that strategy. The reason I do is that it sounds like it's all-inclusive as far as research goes because, indeed, you go into a certain situation with your expertise, and uh, if you are, are ruling out other areas of concern in, in scientific inquiry, all of a sudden you don't really realize that maybe what you're running across is someone else's territory that you'd like to be able to bring in as well to get some uh, additional information and then like you said your list gets longer and longer on you know specific strategies of what to find to find out what the real truth is behind what you're finding there so that's uh that's very admirable good for you thanks right now i think we've got somewhere between 40 and 50 um you know post contact features um that we consider for anything post-colonial or colonial and after, and um, I've got 19 out of 33 criteria that were written about in the Massachusetts Archaeological Society's um, journal, and I'm, I'm trying to hunt down the other, the, you know, the rest of them, 12 or 13, and 14, however many they are. Math is not my strong suit. Um, yeah. But the more we can decipher what that is, and run it through those lists and see what fits and what doesn't, the better we're going to get an understanding of what this is. And, you know, the, the, one of the reasons that people find the content that I'm producing so interesting to begin with is because they get hooked on the mystery. I did. I was... And I wanted to find out more. I wanted to say, you know, I've been thinking about these things for so long. And, you know, I was thinking that they were mostly these things over here. And then I really started to look at it and train my eye and grow these lists of criteria. And then I started thinking, you know, I don't see so much evidence for this anymore as I do for this. And so I've shifted my position. And I know I, I made that clear earlier. I used to think all these other thoughts, and I don't anymore. And, and that's because I've seen so much. When you go through and you see things from state to state to state that probably shouldn't have any connection uh, from a standpoint where you think it's one particular person or a group of people who made something, when you're finding that over and over and over in all of these different places, but these places are seemingly disconnected, you're kind of left with very few answers as to who could have actually done it. 
Good for you. And um, when you're talking uh, pre or colonial or pre-colonial, uh, what are we talking? Are we talking like what? Uh, 1660? What are we talking in time frame? So the story that we've been told is, for, uh, you know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue 1492, right? We, we all know that. Um, that's my Joe Biden version of that line, right? <laughs> So we, we, we understand that, that maybe 1492 was, was when everything changed, okay? So everything after that, um, you know, obviously when we get to the early 1600s, that's when things started picking up here in Massachusetts. But up and down the coast, there were different colonies by different people. The Spanish came here in the 1500s, uh, the Portuguese came here. The English came here in the 1600s, late 1500s. So, got these like small groups of people here prior that we really don't know a whole lot about that we think we do, but we don't actually. So, we have to look at what, how are those people living? What were they doing? What was their lifestyle like? And we have to understand that very early American history. Um, so, everything after that that we know of. Um, could be, hey, we have to consider it, it's, you know, close contact, right? And so everything before that, we've got, well, who was here? Well, we know the Native Americans here were here for at least 10, 12,000 years, probably 20. It keeps going back and back and back. And, and honestly, when I think about it more and more, there were really two groups of people that occupied the country in, in this area for an extended amount of time who were actually capable of producing the amount of stonework that we have here. Now, for listeners who may not have ever heard this before, it's estimated, or let me, let me back up, in 1871 in the United States Agricultural Report, it was estimated that there were 250,000 miles of stone walls in the New England and New York area. Further estimates have said it could be as high as 500,000 miles. That is an enormous amount of stonework, and we can't even comprehend how much work that would be. Yeah. But and by, is, and by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're going to have to take a break right there, but I think that's perfect teaser because uh, people are going to go, oh, my gosh. I got to come back and listen to who the heck was making all those stone walls back then. So we will be right back with uh, Matt Adams, ladies and gentlemen, here at Spaced Out Sunday in just a moment. Hey, Spaced, hey, Spaced Out, Out Radio, Radio fans. fans. It's, it's John, John Resnick, founder of the Chive and Chive Cheer. Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head over to ChiveCharities.org and become a donor today. <sighs> I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do, what to do. Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning bumble f tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious, and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajons.com. At spacedoutradio.com. We are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience has proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. 
For more information, please contact us at sales at spaceoutradio.com. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. Are you addicted to the woo? Good. Me too. This is Dave Scott, and you can woo it up with me every Monday through Friday, starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, for three hours of great entertainment in the subjects you love. UFOs, ghosts, cryptids, intuition, yes, we hit it all five days a week. Look for us at spacedoutradio.com, where together, my friends, we own the night. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Need that weekend supernatural fix? Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm Stacy Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, Stacy and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, it's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hello everyone, this is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESSA. We're glad to team up with Spaced Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Spaced Out Radio website and let's figure out what's going on together. And welcome back. We are back with Matt Adams and Spaced Out Sunday, talking about some fascinating stuff that he has been researching regarding the uh, megalithics. I wouldn't say megalithic, but I'd say stone structures that are, uh, oh man, going back hundreds and hundreds of years. 
um, in the in the northeast uh, United States and probably different places around the planet we're going to be talking about. But Matt, thank you for uh, taking uh, your time out of a uh, a late night on a Sunday here for Spaced Out Radio. I appreciate you having. All right. Well, we were just uh, we were talking about the idea that uh, you literally somehow got interested in this subject out of all the subjects that you could get into what do you suppose turns you to this uh, almost like indiana jones like you said uh archaeological archaeological you know studies uh as was this something at a young age you were interested in in a way i uh and it underground as a kid, and you know, now I chambers. It's kind of the same thing. <laughs> you were breaking up a little bit there, but I think you said that basically you were into underground forts. I used to make them as a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Underground forts. Dig a big hole, cover it over with a couple of two by fours, put some plywood on top, cover it back over, and that was my childhood. <laughs> I crawl in and out of those. Now I'm an adult, I crawl in and out of stone forts that I didn't make. Well, <laughs> is much it? there. Yeah, yeah, although uh, I would imagine that for some reason you you had um, uh, a propensity, not a propensity, but at least not a fear to do that. You you would think that some people, it would drive some people nuts with the claustrophobia stuff, and that would, doesn't seem to bother you. No, not at all. Uh, there are a couple of these. Um, you know, so I stay out of... There's probably two structures I haven't been in that I've been to. Uh, I try to get into everything that I possibly can. Um, and I make as much effort to do that as I can. Yeah, and I would imagine you do some preliminary research ahead of time uh, uh, oh, yeah. to be able to determine if it's safe or not and that kind of thing. Uh, are these kinds of things that uh, you're running across that you are, uh, like you said, some of the first time people have thought about these structures the way you have? Or do, do you usually run across uh, a lot of info before you even get in there or you know find them? So that kind of depends on when we're talking about uh, that that long stretch of time before I, I started really looking in 2017. I didn't have a whole lot of information. And when you don't have a whole lot of information, you tend to start believing things that aren't true, right? And you just, there's a whole bunch of space for your imagination to run wild, right? And then on the other hand, when you have too much information and very little space to reason it out, um, that's kind of the other end of the scale and you start thinking that about conspiracies and all that stuff. So I try to come from a place where I'm balanced, right? I try to have a little bit of information and then a little bit more reasoning to deal with it. And then a little bit more information and then a little bit more reasoning to deal with it. I have to stay balanced. And We get stuck there. Yeah, yeah, we got stuck there in the last uh, uh, twenty seconds. No problem. We're just going to continue on and fill in the blanks uh, if if I think we need to on my end. So you're doing just fine. You just continue on doing what you do, and I will kind of ask you to back up just periodically if if there's something important. But I think you're right. You you just mentioned the fact that. Uh, what you do is you uh, research uh, to get to a certain level of understanding, and then you add to that, and you kind of ratchet up then your understanding. Yeah, you you incrementally increase the amount of information you take in, and you incrementally increase your ability to reason that information out. And if you end up with too much or too little of one or the other, you end up imbalanced. And that's not good for anybody. You've got to stay balanced. 
Yeah, yeah, I'll bet. Oh my. Um, now, at one point, I would imagine you got to that aha moment in your research where you realized that uh, what you were doing, maybe you started out as a kid, you know, kind of being interested in doing this on your own. At one point, and you realize, I suppose, that this thing that you're researching is huge, it is a major, probably, gap in our knowledge. Uh, that we need to know that scientists are not even thinking about. When when did that hit you in your research? Um, I would say 2018. You know, when I really started, like I said, 2017, started to get out there, still had the old ideas, going to more sites, going to more sites. The more you see, the better your eyes trained, the more people you talk to, the more they tell you what certain things are. And then the questions come in. You really start questioning everything that you've thought before because, hey, how could that be true if I'm seeing so much of this stonework out there? How could it be true that, you know, Vikings made it or Phoenicians came or Egyptians were here? I'm not saying they weren't. I'm just saying they didn't make all this stuff. There's no way. They just weren't here in the numbers. Ah, very important. I see. Because a while back at the first of uh, segment, we were me- you were mentioning that there is so much of these stone structures that it's mind boggling. Um, yeah. yeah. So so we I don't think a lot of people realize that you want you might want to uh, reiterate that and tell us what you mean by that. Yeah. So let's get back into the five hundred thousand miles of stone walls. It's it's an inconceivable number. We, we can't even comprehend how that would be possible. Um, and yet, in England, there might be, I think, I forget the exact number, but it's it's maybe a few thousand, yeah, a few thousand miles, maybe a few tens of thousands of miles of stone walls. And we know England has been there forever. We know people have been there for, for centuries and beyond, millennia. But the people that we think, or the majority of archaeologists will tell us, um, who built the stone walls were the, were the colonials and everyone that came after 1492. Um, so we're supposed to believe that 500,000 miles of stone walls, let's not even say that, we're supposed to believe that 250,000 miles of stone wall was built in in a period of about 175 years from when farming became an industry until the uh, introduction of better fencing known as barbed wire. Really, did we have the population here to do that, or is there another explanation? I happen to think, as well as a growing body of, of independent researchers, that the Native Americans had all the time in the world and, and the, very possibly the religious beliefs to warrant them building as much stone wall as, as is out there. And I, I'm not saying they built it all. Obviously, colonists did build stone wall. But there are certain things out there that just don't make any sense when you look at it from a farming perspective. And not every wall is even a wall. What do I mean by that? That's that's really weird, right? What we look at and think of as a stone wall to a Native American might be a snake effigy. We would look at a wavy wall, something that meanders up and down the, the landscape in all different ways and directions, and, and we would think, well, why would a farmer have made a wall like this? That's you don't that's not the European way of thinking of building a straight wall. To, to line property or you know a, a certain uh, plant that they were growing on their farm but when you think about it from a Native American perspective and and they revered animals such as snakes it makes sense that they would have built a stone snake effigy across their landscape um, in what is now being termed as ceremonial stone landscapes and Ceremonial stone landscapes, also known as CSLs for short, um, CSLs transcend just the Northeast. 
they go out into the southwest and the southeast and they go down into Central America and they go down into South America. So they encompass both continents. It's not just something here in, in the northeast, but for some reason, and, and it probably has to do with, with uh, the, the colonial mindset of, of, you know, just kill the Indians. It, and, and everything that went along with that, the mindsets, the stories that were told, the beliefs that people still have to this day, Indians didn't build in stone. They did everywhere else. The Southwest, they did in Central America, Mexico. I mean, you've all seen photos of those things. Tia Tia Kona, right? Inca, Maya, they all built in stone. Why don't we think they built in stone here? Good point. Yeah. Good point. Matter of fact, that big question. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and indeed, when you when you when you uh, couch it in those terms of how prolific uh, those those societies were, it all it begs the question of why? Why would they be doing stone structures like that that are so massive and large? You would, and, and it brings to me the mind of the idea of you know are are they trying to emulate um, or contact some off world you know gods that are that are you know in their area visiting or, or whatever why would they do like you said a large serpent mound in their uh, I mean these are uh, maybe even uh, like you said Native Americans who are um, uh, not necessarily farmers themselves, you know, they're they're hunter gatherers and they move around and stuff. Why would they feel it important to do that? Um, have you have you do you have a theory of uh, why they're doing these kinds of things? Yeah, let me get to that in one second. I want to preface that by saying that we know why the Incas, the Mayas, and and the Native Americans in in South America. We know why they built their temples and their stone structures. Religious reasons. Or their, their spiritual beliefs. We think we know why the Egyptians built the pyramids. It had a lot to do with their spiritual beliefs. Same thing with what's here. Same thing with the snake effigy. And, and I don't say this so much as my theory, but what I've learned about Native American spiritual belief and I could be wrong, and if there's if there's a, a someone out there that can correct me, by all means, I'm open to I'm open to hearing what you have to say. But what I've learned uh, is that they had three different worlds that they believed in, and the underworld, um, where well, I'll get to that in one second. They had the underworld, they had the surface world where we are, the people live, and then they had the sky world. That's all they could see. That's all they knew. And, and that was everything that they believed in. Now, the serpent was relevant and, and uh, revered because it was believed that the serpent was a being that could traverse between this world and the underworld. It could go where they couldn't go, and it could hide in the earth. Um, that might be one of the reasons for stone chambers, so that they themselves could be inside the earth, that they themselves could be like a snake, and perhaps sit in, you know, a snake den. Maybe that's what they are. Um, I don't know. And and the reason that the Native Americans themselves might not even know is because they've lost so much of their history. There were so many of them that died off due to disease, and then I mean, we're talking tens and tens of millions of Native American Indians just dead from disease, from the 1500s onward. Um, then you've got the active persecution of the Native Americans that in some ways, mostly political ways, still happens to this day. Um, but they've had such a loss, especially in the Northeast, especially in the Northeast, also in the plains, but especially here in the Northeast, because it happened for a longer period of time. Um, it didn't really start happening out west until the westward expansion. Um, 
So we've got at least a, a couple hundred years on that here in the Northeast. So they, they have lost a lot of the, the oral traditions that were passed down. They lost a lot of their cultural and spiritual beliefs that, that weren't passed down, that died out. But you think about, just put your mind into what it would be like to live off of the earth 24-7. That's all you ever know, and that's all generations of your people have ever known, is living off the land. You, over time, you develop those spiritual beliefs. You develop those stories. It's something relatively new to me, but some of these oral stories and traditions that get passed down might actually be the map of the world around them. And, and some of the features in the stories might be the landmarks that they see when they go out. You see the sun every day, you see the moon every day, you see the stars every day. You start to develop stories about them, why they move the ways that they do. Talk to any average person on Earth right now, ask them how the sun moves, they're not going to know. And if they don't know how the sun moves, they're not going to know how the moon moves. And believe me, that's pretty difficult to understand how the moon moves. Uh, and you're not going to be paying attention to things like that. We've sort of transcended the need for that knowledge, and we've delegated it into certain areas of our life. NASA keeps track of all that stuff. The space agencies for whatever country keep track of all that stuff. Astronomers, right? We have those people that keep track of that knowledge. And in our human pursuit of more and more and more knowledge... We're taken further and further away from the Earth. But I think, it, there, well, first there are multiple levels to get to where we are now. We're probably about three or four levels higher than, than the tribal way of belief, right? Um, but those ways are not ways of the past. They don't have to be ways of the past. They can coexist with everything that we know now, yeah. if we choose, and if we if we choose to live our life that way. And the more and more I research this, the more and more I, I start to identify with that and make it a part of my life. Oh, that is fascinating! Very well put. We're going to be right back, folks, with more of uh, Matt Adams and uh, the megalithic structures of the Northeast, etc on Spaced Out Sunday in just a moment. So hang on, we'll be right back. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you, and we can work around any budget. From commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at space.radio.com. If you like it hot, real hot, then heat up your meals with Bumblefoot Hot Sauce. Get your Bumblefoot hot sauce today. The sauce, Bumblelicious, and the 4 million Scoville unit, Bumble, f we're going in hot, real hot, coming out even hotter. Keep the milk nearby. And tantalize your taste buds tonight. Bumblefoot hot sauce, available now at kajans.com. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Visit PurplePlates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. 
Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up? All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. Hey everyone, I'm John Edwards. And I'm Stacy Edwards. Together we're taking over Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio where we're going to bring our own experiences of the paranormal and talk to the best people we can find to help bring you answers to your strange tales. We're here to entertain your need for weekend. Woo! So tune us in at spacedoutradio.com starting at 906 Pacific, 1206 AM Eastern where we can all get a little spooky together. Spaced Out Saturday nights right here at spacedoutradio.com. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Hi. This is Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. Are you an experiencer of something strange that can't be explained? Do you want help finding out what's going on? I'm Ryan Stacy, head of the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESSA. We've teamed up with Spaced Out Radio to investigate cases filled out in the SOR Sightlines Report. We are independent, and there's no cost to what we do. All we need is your experience. Let's find out what's happening together on the SOR Sightlines Report. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Dave Scott, and I'm bringing you the woo every Monday through Friday on Spaced Out Radio. I'm going all out to bring you the strangest, oddest stories and subjects I could find for your entertainment. Why? Because when we hit peak woo, I know I've done my job. So come tune us in at spacedoutradio.com, 906 Pacific, 1206 AM Eastern, and together, my friends, we own the night. Hey, welcome back to hour number two of Spaced Out Sunday. I am your host, uh, paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. 
Thanks for joining me. We welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates, WQEE 99.1 FM in Noonan, Georgia, and UPRN 107.7 New Orleans. And on the digital side, we are very proud to be on Revolution Radio. And don't forget, you can always check out our archives for free at any time at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do us all a favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to some Bumblefoot, shopping at our Spaced Out Radio store, and catching up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire, and so much more. And boy, are we having a blockbuster show tonight with researcher and uh, paleologist and (laughs) rockhound... And a real interesting guy, Matt Adams, who is uh, literally telling us about some of the megalithic structures, stone walls, and uh, uh, those kinds of things in the in the northeast of the United States, as well as different portions around the world. So, Matt, this is a lot of fun. Thank you for joining me on Spaced Out Sunday. Thanks again for having me. really appreciate being here. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, we are going to get you on the big screen so everybody can see everything that you're doing right now on your end and in my uh, little window also so they can see both of us. You know, um, it occurred to me that we were talking about these structures and how long they've been there. Um, but I just got to thinking... When you go and do your research, when you uh, do your field studies and things, do you also run across paranormal activity or or certain stories that kind of go along with these structures? Or are they just a scientific analysis that you're doing? It's purely scientific analysis. Um, I have had a couple of people tell me about their experiences, but on the whole, you know, haven't been to 170 sites i've got two stories maybe from other people so um it's something that you know you just kind of store away and tuck away for later yeah yeah uh and obviously it's you know there are certain people that go out with uh you know electronic devices and ghost boxes and all sorts of things you know for those kinds of things it sounds like you're more of a scientific approach of uh you know what can you actually prove as far as these structures are concerned. Is that what you're concerned about? Right, yeah, and a lot of what we see are are alignments to the sun and and different heavenly bodies. Is that a theme that you keep running across, that people are doing things like this to uh, the ground, to the rocks, and structures because of something that uh, motivates them like that? Yeah, I would say so. Uh, For instance, uh, now through two or three different states, Um, Maine, Massachusetts, and um, I think it was Pennsylvania. If if there were surveyors out a couple hundred years ago, or whenever, you know, where one of their, I guess methods would be the right word, but one of their methods to align a boundary property to a summer solstice sunset on one side and the winter solstice sunrise on the other. They're 180 degrees from each other. That's half of 360. It's it's straight. It makes sense. But one of them is a stone wall, or I think two of them were stone walls, and then another one was a row of boulders. And the row of boulders was on sort of the edge of a cliff. Half of it was, anyway. And the, the cliff was maybe 20 or 30 feet drop. It wasn't spectacular. But it's not a property, property boundary either. So why am I finding different results, or sorry, the same result for different stone structures separated by a, a pretty good distance, a few hundred miles? Um, if it was a technique of a surveyor, okay, fine. I, I don't know that it was. I don't have any evidence that it was. Um, I'm hoping somebody can come forward and, and tell me, yeah, they used that, or no, they, they definitely didn't. Um, but it's one of the questions that I have at this point. Um, what would motivate somebody to do it is, well, you've got the shortest day of the year on one side and the longest day of the year on the other. 
that would make sense to somebody who had that that spiritual belief and they were watching the sun move all year long. They would know, okay, well, this is the last, you know, time that it's, it's, the sun is going to be here. It's going to start coming back. Now we know that spring is coming, so we can plan. And, you know, however, I'm sure they counted days in some way. Um, that in X amount of days, it was going to be either time to migrate or time to plant food or whatever. And vice versa with the, the summer solstice sunset. It's the longest day of the year. And we got stuck, didn't we? Yeah, just the last 15 seconds there. No problem. I think we got your... Uh thought though I think that's a good good observation I mean if you're running across the same kind of uh, structures that do that uh, aligning of the uh, the summer and the winter solstice that would make sense that they're they're doing that uh, you know to kind of give them an idea of uh, the cyclical time during the year that they need to to worry about I mean obviously they're tied to the land they're tied to uh, the land providing for them and uh, if they don't plan ahead like you said um, you know this is about the time of year where we got to start moving to a different place or uh, go to a certain location uh, it would make sense that they they would do that over a period of years a period of decades or eons you know they would make it a lot easier for uh, you to pass on that information and wisdom uh, to generations down the road. I, I assume, from what I gather, uh, looks like we'll wait till we get reconnected here. Sorry about that, we got dropped a second ago, but uh, what, what I was going to say was that I, I've heard that the Native Americans would think, were thinking like seven generations ahead, you know, as far as their planning. Uh, so these are civilizations that uh, had a lot long-term you know, frame a reference than we do nowadays. Yeah, I hadn't heard that about them thinking seven generations ahead. Um, that's interesting if, if that is how, how they were thinking. Um, but what I do know is that these alignments to the sun are so common. They're so common that whoever was whoever made these things everybody in in the community must have known it. it wasn't you know arcane knowledge it didn't take a special person like a priest to to know that you know this side of the wall goes to the summer solstice and this side of the wall goes to the winter solstice because it was everywhere they're just so common it, it, it had to have been in everybody's mind it must have been like You know, I think, uh, I think you're right. Um, maybe the main difference between Native American society and uh, maybe European society was the fact that I think you're right. More people in the society knew the secrets, uh, the codes, maybe here on this continent than they did in Europe. Maybe it was kind of like a, priesty, a priestly cast of secrets that they would try to uh, maintain you know, in Europe, and uh, it, it would make sense that uh, what we know about Native, Native uh, Americans is that uh, they're generally, the society in itself seems to be more spiritual as a whole than, than just a priestly class, you know. Yeah, that's fascinating that you've come up with that, that theory. Yeah, absolutely, they were more, much more spiritual. Uh, you see that in the tribes that are still alive and around today, and and there you see their their dances and their ceremonies and go to a powwow, right? It's just YouTube it, powwow, right? And and look up what happens there. It's a lot of ceremony. It's a lot of different kinds of ceremony. If it might look all the same to us, dancing, singing, playing drum, maybe some flute music, but it's much deeper to them because every one of those dances has a meaning. And, and the tribes were so different that 
Michael, if you had a tribe out there in, in that part of the country, um, Seattle, and if I had a tribe here, even if we had connection, right, our two tribes could be totally different. Not to say they were entirely different, because a lot of the same uh, understandings about some of the stone structures exist on both continents. And how would that happen unless, you know, one, enormous amounts of time had had uh, elapsed and all of these people had somehow had some connection at some point in the past to, to be able to share these things. And, and we know from research in Europe and in that part of the world that cultures did share things with each other and, and they did go from tribe to tribe to tribe and they did surpass different languages there were uh, even the, the Egyptians and the Greeks had two languages written and translated on one stone that right there is evidence of this so you know they were they were the same and they were different they each had their own individual identities and and all of that but they also had all of this same knowledge as well um, I don't know if you've ever done any geological um, genealogy work for your own family. How, do you have any background of uh, what your um, ancestors came from? Or is this Europe, European background for you? Uh, any Native American in there at all? You know, it's it's like Elizabeth Warren. You know, she said there was some in there, and, and maybe there is somewhere down there. Um I heard kind of the same similar story in my family, but it was, you know, generations ago. I know that um, two generations, no, sorry, three generations ago, my great grandparents came from Ireland and Italy on one side. They came from Finland and um, French Canada on the other, and somewhere in that French Canadian. There may have been some uh, some Native American. Not sure. Um, I know my aunt did a lot of research, but I don't think she ever found anything conclusive that would say that. Oh, that's that's fascinating uh, for me, just because uh, I do have some of that French Canadian connection to American Indian in my family. My my mother's grandmother was. Uh, a Cree Indian married to a French Canadian trapper dude, you know, wow. that came. Of course, the Cree were in the uh, central part of Canada, just above the United States. And of course, all the French came over, you know, with the, the trappers and stuff. So, yeah, you've got some similar issues there in your your uh, background as well. As far as that DNA, that isn't that's not very far back. You know, your grandparents, your great grandparents or even their parents. That's not too far back to uh, have some influence as far as DNA goes. But um, fascinating stuff how we um, literally um, lose track of some of those stories that uh, are, are kind of interesting in the fact that when you're, when you're talking generations of 50 and 100 generations, you know, only a handful of generations when you can think about it is not that long ago. Yeah, I've heard the number of 500 generations of Native Americans had been here before, before now, and 500 generations, it's, it's time immemorial. Um, there's this analogy I use to try to convey that amount of time to people, and the amount of Native Americans who were here on the continent. And the analogy goes like this. If only one arrowhead was lost every year, there'd be 12,000 of them out there. And if there were two, there'd be 24,000 of them out there. Just keep going with the math. Wow. It, it boggles your mind just to understand how, how many were here and how long. Good, good point. Matter of fact, yeah. And when you when you talk to folks like yourself, who literally probably have come across finding those 
stone arrowheads. Uh, those astronomical figures get blown out of proportion, obviously. Yeah, so I, I've got to draw a differentiation there. I don't actually collect arrowheads. I don't hunt them. Um, I don't do anything subsurface. Everything I look at is above the surface. Um, I do that because, one, it's kind of part of the, the ethics. Um, you know, don't dig at these sites. Uh, we believe that they are archaeological sites and that the ground should be preserved. So that's one reason I also don't give out locations publicly on the Internet um, or to people that I don't really know that well. So if I see somebody, you know, doing that kind of thing, I'll say, hey, 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 you know, I know what you're trying to do here. That's great. But, you know, in this community, we don't post locations. And that's for the safety of the structure and what's there. And, and also so that other people don't go there and, and tamper with the soil. Yeah, I'll bet. Wow, very good. That's, that's uh, something to think about, obviously, when, when we're out there, you know, researching, uh, leaving, the, uh, leaving the specimens the way we found them or even, in, you know, in any kind of better position for uh, further research would be definitely something you'd want to do. Um, I want to make sure that people realize where they're going to find your videos <clears throat> and projects so that uh, we can promote that during the show tonight a uh, couple times for sure. So tell people a little bit about how they find you. So if you hashtag um, Nessie, N-E-H-S-S-I-E, sounds very much like the Loch Ness Monster nickname, Nessie, but with an H in there, N-E-H-S-S-I-E. You can hashtag that on Instagram, probably Pinterest, Facebook and YouTube, and you'll find the channels. You can also go to Nessie.com, N-E-H-S-S-I-E.com, and if you'd like to sign up for my upcoming book, I'm going to give it away for free, you can do that at book.nessie.com. Wow. Uh, we're going to have to, uh, I think after the break here, get into the details of this new book. Uh, for folks, give them a little bit of a teaser of what you're uh, talking about because that sounds like a fascinating opportunity to get a free research tool from you. Uh, you got a title for this uh, project at this point? I do. Um, essentially, it's going to be what you just said, though, a research tool. I want to teach people what it's taken me three years to learn how to research these things because I want to turn them loose so that they can go find these things on their own. There's so many of them out there, and it's it's pretty simple once you know the techniques, but uh, it's going to be the field guide to investigating stone sites of the Northeast United States. Very nice. Um, so you're going to be, uh, it's kind of like a, a how-to book. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, I'll use examples from the field. I'm not giving away locations. It's not that kind of book. Don't get your hopes up. But if you're interested in researching this kind of thing, I'm going to give you the tools. I'm going to show you how to do it and set you loose so you can go do it yourself. And then you can go out there and see for yourself if these things exist. Well, would this allow then somebody who's interested in a different part of the country, say the Southwest, uh, to pick up your uh, research tool and be able to go in their neck of the woods and recognize certain structures and things to uh, to research? I would say that probably portions of it, yes. Because, like as I mentioned before, uh, the stone structures that exist here are similar to the ones that exist there. So you might not find exactly the same things, but you might find some things that are very similar, and you'll definitely find some different things. And whether you can apply these techniques to that or not, I don't know yet. That's for you to go out and figure out. And if you do figure that out, and it does turn out to be the case, by God, get back to me and let me know that I'm on to something. Yeah, yeah. And some of your research techniques then uh, might apply to different areas that uh, you have no knowledge of at one point, but uh, uh, people will be using your tools uh, to gather maybe some similar results, which would be kind of interesting. Do you have a website then that you can have people um, share information with? That's what Nessie.com is, and it's not entirely done being built yet, but that will be here um, in 
on the site at some point. Yeah, absolutely. People will be able to come in, make an entire field report uh, with everything that they found. They'd be able to submit photos, um, possibly links to video, and uh, then someone like myself. And, and as Nessie grows, there will be other team members that will be able to, to look at that and, and look into it, research it a bit, and add that to the database. Yeah, yeah, I'll bet. Oh, that would be fascinating, wouldn't it, to uh, have people uh, communicating about their research from different areas of the country and the world on one website. Um, are you also kind of giving them tips on uh, maybe gear and uh, uh, things that they need to think about if they're going out in the field? Yeah, there'll be a section on ethics, and there'll be a section on what kind of tools you can use, the apps for your phone and that kind of thing. And um, I just want to throw this out there, too. There's a, a proposal that's been offered to me, and I'm, I'm going to take it up. Um, but someone offered their technology to me for this purpose. At some point, we will have an app where people can submit all of their information through to the database. Wow. So if that already exists, somebody is just going to, you know, create a white label version and, and slap our branding on for us and, you know, maybe their their uh, name will be on it as well because it is their technology. Um, but the 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 owner of that company, the founder, he's uh, he's interested in this stuff too, and he's offered that to us. So, um, you know, hey, if there's anybody out there who hears this and, and you're interested and you want, you know, get in touch and and become part of the team. Those are kind of the people that we're we're looking for as leaders as Nessie grows. Oh, that's. That's a fun idea that uh, you're bringing this into technology at the same time there. Okay, well, we're, we're here with Matt Adams, and we are going to take a break again uh, at the uh, bottom of the hour here for six more minutes or so. Matt, this is fascinating. Hold on to your hat, buddy. We'll be right back in just a moment. All right. Cold, Cold drinks, drinks, great, great food, food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Vancouver is the place, place to be. be. Open until 2 a.m. Everything on the menu starts at just six ninety five. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes. It's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hey, space travelers. This is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great form for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com.
Looking for something new to push your limits? Look beyond the spectrum. A new docu-series featuring some of the best researchers in the world when it comes to everything from UFOs, government cover-ups, and strange humanoids. Truth seekers Stephen Bassett, Jeff Meldrum, Jack Kasher, and Stan Friedman, among others, all chip in to bring their knowledge to you. Beyond the Spectrum can be found on Amazon as well as Tubi TV. Tell us what you think on our Amazon page. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. So for more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. At spacedoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Hello everyone, this is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We're glad to team up with Spaced Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Spaced Out Radio website and let's figure out what's going on together. weekend supernatural fix look no further than spaced out saturday right here at spacedoutradio.com i'm stacy edwards and i'm john edwards each saturday night stacy and i are going to bring you the best in paranormal cryptids ufos you name it and we're going there it's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you so tune us in every saturday night on spaced out saturdays starting at 906 p.m pacific 1206 a.m eastern only at spacedoutradio.com Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month and follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do? What to do? Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning bumble. Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. Okay, we are back on Spaced Out Sunday with Matt Adams, the Indiana Jones of the Northeast. I like that. And this is a lot of fun, buddy. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight on Spaced Out Sunday and imparting this interesting knowledge that you've come across as far as these uh, stone structures that seem to be prevalent, not just in the Northeast, but in uh, various Americas as well, North, South, and Central, it sounds like. Um, but boy, um, it's fascinating to me that you've been able to uh, gather this information at, at, at some, such a young age. You, you got into this even younger uh, than most people, it sounds like. Well, I don't know how... Uh, I'm 40 now, but I got into this maybe when I was 23, 24. So around that age, a couple of young kids um, looking for something to do, found that book, started bringing the kids actually to, to some of these sites and, you know, sharing that stuff. With them. It was fun. It was I, fun. 
I remember that Indian, Indiana Jones movie where, uh, what was his dad, Sean Connery in the films, you know, taking uh, young Indy to some of these places and stuff. Did you have a father or uh, anybody like a grandfather that was a mentor for you in that regard? No, not really. Um, it was like I found the book and started going to find these things on my own. Um, and then, you know, sort of as I got into it more and more when I was older, um, I was on one field trip with Nira back in 2004. Mm. So it was that. But then, you know, fast forward to 2017, and that's really when I got involved with, with other people. And since then, I've had... Um, a few different mentors saying, you know, just loosely mentoring, saying, hey, look at this or look at that. Or, uh, a lot of people just share information with each other. Um, I've got a couple of really, really good friends from, from this, more than a couple, I should say. And we don't all think the same. We don't all believe the same things, but we discuss and we listen to each other and we, you know, chew each other's ideas out and, and really try to, you know, Con not so much convince each other that they're wrong or that we're right, but challenge their thinking and why it is that they believe it. And Michael, if I were to challenge you um, about law or something that you're quite well versed in, I'm going to learn from that, right? So it's part of a way for us to learn from each other, so much as it is uh, a reason for us to disagree or have an argument. Um, very typically, we get along when we have these conversations. You know, we understand where each other stands and, and why we believe certain things that we do. But it's great to have each other there because we think so differently. And just some of the advice that I've gotten from my friends who just think so completely differently, I'll listen to it and I'll think, you know, he's really got a good point there. Or she's really got a good point there. And, and you know, you do change the way you're thinking because of these kinds of conversations that, that are designed to challenge your ideas. Oh, that's fascinating uh, that you are able to do that with your colleagues at uh, uh, gatherings, I would imagine, conferences and those kinds of things. Um, it, it, yeah, it, it occurred to me that uh, your profession, your research maybe is a little bit uh, easier to do even during not even during this covid lockdown but during the covid lockdown that does not seem to at least stop you from being able to go out and do what you normally do in the first place so that's quite unique in your field of research absolutely uh, the only thing really that covid changed for me is i stopped performing the regular kind of work that I was doing and um, I was able to get more into this uh, full time not always going out but sitting at home writing the book or researching on the computer or I had more time to focus on this stuff and it's it's been absolutely wonderful for that it didn't really stop me from traveling either um, I not to say I didn't run into any challenges, but I didn't stop going from state to state because of any of this. I just did. Um, the other thing is, and this will rub some listeners the wrong way, might rub yourself the wrong way, but I never put on a mask. I've never done it since the whole thing started. And at the beginning, I had thought, you know, maybe this is something serious. And as things progressed, it just... It's, it seemed like less and less of a need to do so. Um, and that's just how I feel about it. And I respect that anybody else can feel differently about it. And I ask that people just respect that that's the way that I feel about it. But I, that sometimes asking that seems to be too much. Yeah. No, I totally understand where you're coming from there. In that regard, I respect that. That's good. I'm glad you, I'm glad you say that. Uh, I think people ought to uh, stand up for their own convictions uh, especially when uh, the science is uh, very iffy either way in that regard to begin with. So uh, we need to kind of keep that in perspective. And you are a scientist. You are these kinds of people that uh, weigh the uh, options either way. And 
you know, the consequences either way. So uh, it's interesting and fr refreshing that you're that way. So thank you. Um, by the way, uh, it occurs to me that uh, basically uh, you you have got, uh, oh, we, we've got to get into some of the actual maybe locations that, you, that you've come across that maybe some people don't know about. Because we've talked about just a few of them and some of your videos, but I think it would be fascinating if you have like some stories that we can relate now as far as you being out in the field and doing your research, uh, because I think more and more people would be interested in going to watch your videos uh, if we can explain about what you do. Sure. So I start this whole project as... Um, what I wanted to be a documentary and I, I quickly realized that it's, it's, it has to be bigger than a documentary. And I say that in the singular because two hours, you can't, we're going to have a conversation about this for three hours. Okay. Or, or yeah. About. Right. Uh, we can't possibly talk about everything. I can't possibly relay everything in that amount of time. Um, so I quickly realized that there needs to be a documentary for each site, um, or at least that kind of approach to it. Some sites, you know, I know of a, of a, a mother and son team that investigate this stuff, and they've got maybe a six-hour video documentary on one site. So there's that. And then there's what I want to do, which is bring people to these sites and explain what I'm seeing and, and investigate the site and show them that. So I put a, a kind of half-assed pilot together, and if anybody wants to see it, it's available right now. It's about 40 minutes. It's rough. It's a very rough cut. It's on the website, nessie.com. Check it out, N-E-H-S-S-I-E.com. And 40 minutes long, and it's about a site in New Jersey called Tripod Rock, Pyramid Mountain. Um, initially, when I started filming, uh, the documentary was supposed to be about Tripod Rock itself. What is Tripod Rock? It is somewhere between 160 and 190 or so ton boulder sitting on top of three smaller stones that are still actually quite large. Um, and there's three legs to it, so tripod rock, right? And, and you look at it, and it just baffles your mind how it could have ever possibly gotten there. Now, I had originally, like I said, started this documentary on that one particular thing in the immediate area around it. However, on my trips into tripod rock, and I came in from a couple of different angles. One, the hike in there is about maybe an hour or so, and if you stop to look around for things, it can get a little bit longer than that. Um, but there's a lot that caught my eye um, on the trail that goes up there. But that wasn't my first uh, venture in there. I had taken another path. Or some of it wasn't even a path. It was just, you know, tromping through the woods. And, and wow, there's all these stone structures here that are way off the path. Yet, they're the same and they're similar as the ones that I see everywhere else. So, okay, fair enough that we've got some of that stuff. Um, and then I continued on through the trail and, and, you know, over maybe six different visits, I saw more and more of the area and realized that in order for me to explain the full context of Tripod Rock, I have to document all of this all these other features in the immediate area. And, you know, this area covers a couple of, you know, probably four square miles of, of land, mountains up and down. And, you know, mountains in New Jersey, so they're not terribly big, um, but mountains nonetheless and, and, and rough landscape. So I've got 40 minutes thrown together. I took that 40 minutes. I sent it to probably 12 or 15 different people. I said, watch this and, and please give me your feedback. And I got tons of wonderful feedback from that. Um, and as I got some feedback and after another trip there, I was able to make improvements to the actual documentary itself. 
and I was able to include more research. Some of the research that I had gotten into was an old field report that was older than I am, uh, written in the late 70s. I was born in 80. So it's going back quite a ways. And the advantage that we have now is we have tools that either didn't exist back then or were too complicated to use, and, and you just didn't own that. Okay, I've got an app on my phone that someone used to carry over their shoulder or on a backpack. Um, you ever see a surveyor on the side of the street with one of those big things on a tripod? Yeah. Okay, the tool was very similar to that, but it told you where the sun was, and you could watch and you could figure out, you would do your calculations right there on it by hand, and you could figure out where the sun was going to set and all of that. Okay, that's in my phone now, right? That's how... That's how far we've come technology-wise. Um, so it's very easy for me to, to take all of these different readings in field, and I can do, I don't know, half a dozen to a dozen readings in the amount of time that it would have taken a scientist 40 years ago to get one reading. So that's how far in advanced that we are now with technology. Um, one of the... One of the things from that field report that I was able to, I only went to look at it to say, hey, that's really cool. I want to see it because I believed what was in the field report. And I, I went to just see it for myself and say, wow, I want to see that. I ended up debunking it, and I didn't mean to, but that's just what happened. So on top of Tripod Rock, on top of that boulder, um, if you look at it, there's a flat face, and if you stand to the north of it and you look south at that side of it, it's a flat face, and there's a triangular kind of crest uh, that runs the length of the top, actually. And in that field report, the, the researchers look. like you know, the next mountain over, right? So I went to look for that, and I went to Google Earth, and I said, okay, there's Tripod Rock. You can see it in Google Earth. And I used the little line tool and said, okay, here's the line from, from that, you know, triangular crest on top, and I stretched it out as far as I needed to go, probably three-quarters of a mile. They would never had been able, never would have been able to do it back then. And it didn't go through the pass. But where did it go? My God. Um, it went to probably one of the highest spots on that next mountain. Now, that's significant because we find a lot of things at high spots. Why? Um, I'm going to bring you back to what I said earlier about the Native American belief system about the three worlds. The underworld, this world, and the sky world. The high points were where this world and the sky world met. So they were revered and they had significance in, in belief. And we had that's why we have, you know, a, a cere what I think is a ceremonial stone landscape completely surrounding tripod rock. Um, not everything, not every rock you see is going to have some significant meaning, but there are a lot of things that I saw that said, you know what, this is sacred land. And there's a little visitor center down at the parking lot, and um, that's been put in. A lot of people did a lot of good work to get that there. In that visitor center is a very small display of Lenny Lenape uh, artifacts and, and some write-ups about their traditions. Um, so we know that the Native Americans were in that area. And um, so let me kind of go back. Tripod rock is significant for a bunch of different reasons. One, that boulder is there. It's up on top of three smaller boulders. Doesn't look like it should even still be there, yet it is. And off to the side of it are numerous other rocks. Two in particular are uh, boulders in their own right, maybe four and a half feet high. Um, you know, about a thousand pounds each probably. And underneath them are small, flat stones that sort of 
lock them into place and prevent them from rolling anywhere. Now, um, at another part of the site, maybe um, 20 feet away and in front of those, is another stone. And the researchers in that field report thought that um, if you stood at like next to this stone, next to this other boulder, and you looked between those two boulders that I just described, um, you would see the summer solstice sunset. Now that's true. But while I was there at the site, I had previously learned different things uh, about where you would make a or an uh, astrological. Oh, um, no, sorry. Where you would make an, uh, what's the word? Astronomical? Not, it's, no, it's like, oh God, it's like right there, I'm having a brain fart. It's like two in the morning here, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, Ar- you're doing fine, man. Archaeoastronomical, that's what it is. Oh, okay, Ar- sure, yeah. <clears throat> the archaeology part are the two boulders that were placed there. And then the astronomical part, obviously, is that the sun is there, right? So we've got this archaeoastronomical alignment. Now, what I learned about that, to bring it back and finish my sentence, was that there had to be two points. One point would be from which you make the observation, and then the other one would be, you know, where it actually happens. Kind of like a gun sight. Yeah. First time you line up with the second part, and that's where you want your bullet to go. Yeah. Okay? Um, so where was the first, where was the first gun site? It, it didn't make sense to me that it would be right next to this boulder. Why would you stand next to a boulder? I'd never, I'd never come across that. That was a possibility, but I'd never heard of it. What I did hear was that there are stone seats around if you look for them. So I went and I stood in that spot next to the boulder and I looked between those two boulders that were placed and I said you know this doesn't feel right and I I started to look around and I did a complete 180 and lo and behold right behind me was this stone seat it was a smaller boulder that had been cracked in a couple of different places and uh, it's a little bit like this there's a higher spot and a higher spot, and then in the front, there's a lower spot. Now, on either one of these sides, you could put your butt there, and then you'd pivot a certain way, and your feet would stay you know, down here in the middle. Um, and if my butt was positioned on this side, I could look off between those two boulders, and that's where the observation was, right there from that stone seat to those two boulders. And I'm like, wow. So then I moved my butt to the other position, and I've got, you know, my phone here in my hands, and I'm looking at augmented reality. I have an app that shows me where the sun is going to be on the solstices and equinox and where it is today. So I've got four lines total. Pivot here. Here's Tripod Rock. The equinox, I mean, Tripod Rock is big, but the equinox sets on top of it. But then again, the sun's going to set on top of that for you know, probably two months in either direction. So that's not saying much. It's not it's not too significant, but keep it in mind for later. I pivot a little bit more to my left, and now I'm seeing what kind of looks like a diamond-shaped boulder um, sitting there, and the winter solstice sunset was just enough to hit the corner of the boulder. There's another alignment from the same place. So... Now we're starting to see a bit of a bigger picture, right? So I've got that. I've made, you know, two two different alignments from the same spot. But let's go back to Tripod Rock. I talked about that tri- triangular ridge that goes across. One of the last things I did, one of the my one of my probably first or second trip up there, I I was getting ready to leave. I packed everything up, and I looked up on top of that and from the side the long side I'm looking at it and I'm like that looks like the profile of a man there was a forehead and a nose and kind of indistinguishable features down after that but he 
looked like he was lying on top of tripod rock looking up at the sky. Well, maybe I just made that up entirely in my head, okay? Maybe I did. I'm perfectly willing to concede that point. Maybe I'm seeing stuff paradoid in, right? Maybe I'm seeing stuff that isn't really there. Um, so I left and I thought about that and I said, you know, that's really interesting. That's so interesting. The next time I went, I made sure to bring somebody with me and uh, there are logs that are just kind of lying around and people use them to climb up on top of tripod rock. Now, we've already covered I'm kind of a portly guy, right? Uh, I'm a little bit thick around the waist climbing up on top of rocks. It, it's really not something I'm, I'm typically you know, very good at these days, right? Maybe when I was a kid I could do that, but not so much now. But I got up there because the research had to be done, you know. And at risk to myself, maybe I was going to fall when I got down, I don't know. But I had to get up there and I had to, to look at that, that profile and see if there was anything about it. There's a notch in the eye, and I believe that notch to be man-made. I'm not 100% on it. I had a geologist at the site. But he was portly around the waist, too, and he was in his 60s, and he wasn't going to get up there and, and do the research. Uh, but I tried. I said, look, l let me just get you up on the logs, and he didn't even want to do that. Uh, so anyway, uh, I took a reading on that same app that, that shows me where the sun is from, from right in front of the eye. Now, if I'm, like, square in front of the eye, where? Where is the eye? Where does it point to? What is directly behind that equinox? Wow. Right there. It sets right into the eye. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, there's, there's 360 other angles where this could go, okay? It's dead on 270 degrees? Dead on? Wow. Wow. That's that's either one hell of a coincidence, and I have pareidolia, or it's by design. You know, like yeah. we can to, to subtract from the possibilities what it actually is. Um, oh my, that that is fascinating. Well, I think that's a good teaser right there uh, to stop. And get ready for our break because uh, we've got another one coming up here in just a moment. But um, oh my goodness, I really love it. Uh, this is this is fascinating, Matt. We will be right back in just a few moments here with Spaced Out Sunday again uh, with Matt Adams. Stay with us. Hey, hey Space, Space Travelers, this, this is John, John Resnick, commander of the Tribe and Tribe Chair. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Tribe Charities, just go to tribecharities.org forward slash donate. Are you an experiencer of something strange that can't be explained? Do you want help finding out what's going on? I'm Ryan Stacy, head of the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We've teamed up with Spaced Out Radio to investigate cases filled out in the SOR Sightlines report. We are independent and there's no cost to what we do. All we need is your experience. Let's find out what's happening together on the SOR Sightlines report. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. 
Hi there, this is Dave Scott, and I'm bringing you the woo every Monday through Friday on Spaced Out Radio. I'm going all out to bring you the strangest, oddest stories and subjects I could find for your entertainment. Why? Because when we hit peak woo, I know I've done my job. So come tune us in at spacedoutradio.com, 906 Pacific, 1206 AM Eastern, and together, my friends, we own the night. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up. All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. If you like it hot, real hot, then heat up your meals with Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get your Bumblefoot hot sauce today. The sauce, Bumblelicious, and the 4 million Scoville unit, Bumble. F- We're going in hot, real hot, coming out even hotter. Keep the milk nearby. And tantalize your taste buds tonight. Bumblefoot hot sauce, available now at kajans.com. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye. We all know on Spaced Out Radio, we love a good beard and mustache. So why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you, and we can work around any budget. From commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Hi. This is Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Hey everyone, I'm John Edwards. And I'm Stacy Edwards. Together we're taking over Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio where we're going to bring our own experiences of the paranormal and talk to the best people we can find to help bring you answers to your strange tales. We're here to entertain your need for weekend. Woo! So tune us in at spacedoutradio.com starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern where we can all get a little spooky together. Spaced Out Saturday nights right here at spacedoutradio.com. Oh, 
Welcome back to our number three of Spaced Out Sunday. I am your host, Michael W. Hall. Thank you for being with us. We uh, welcome back everyone and listening in on our terrestrial affiliates, WQEE 99.1 FM in Noonan, Georgia, and UPRN 107.7 FM in New Orleans. On the digital side, we're also on Revolution Radio. Don't forget, you can always check out our archives at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do us all a favor and hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to some Bumblefoot and shopping at our Spaced Out Radio store. Do us all a favor and hit that subscribe button. And of course, uh, our radio uh, store is uh, Spaced Out uh, Radio and the SOR Newswire. Sorry about that. We got SOR with Captain Shirk. So enjoy that and welcome back. We are on our final uh, leg of Spaced Out Sunday here with Matt Adams. And we, uh, you know, it occurred to me, Matt, that uh, it's fascinating to me that you have these apps on your phone that literally... Uh, will allow you to make quick uh, c- calculations that uh, in the old days, if they were, you know, for instance, doing a survey, uh, literally they would have to uh, either wait for the summer solstice to be there or try to, try to calculate it with certain instruments that would be fascinating, you know, like, you know, Lewis and Clark's on the kind of stuff that they would carry with us. You might want to give us a little bit of education on what kind of apps these things are that really that were really helpful for you yeah so the first one is called Sunseeker and you can find that in either the well I know you can find it in the app store the Apple app store I think you can find it in Google Play but don't quote me on that I don't actually know um, but if you don't there's probably something similar that you could use from Play Store. Um, and so essentially what it does is it uses your camera. You see everything normally that you'd see behind, but it superimposes uh, a grid um, that shows you latitude and, and longitude sort of for the sky, like how high you are, how, um, like where you are on the 360, um, you know, your compass settings, right? The azimuth pointing it at um so you, you get all those readings and it, it's kind of confusing for people when they first look at it they don't quite understand it um but you know find a quick tutorial online and, and it'll show you very quickly how to use it so as long as you know um where you you know where you want to look for something you just see if there's an alignment there and there, you can't find this is a very common misconception is that, oh, you can just point this thing at anything and any two stones and you're going to come up with something. That's not how it works. You can't just point it at two stones and, and come up with something. Um, go out and try it for yourself and you'll see that. So when people see me do that, um, it's because I know where to look. Like if someone's observing me for the first time doing that, that's because I, I see something that I want to look at to check. Sometimes I find it, and other times I don't. But very often I do because I've learned where to look. So to an untrained eye, someone who's seen that for the first time, that's maybe the mindset that they get. But that's that's not how it is in reality. So hopefully that'll give you something to go off of. And, and yeah, you know, and. Um, I've noticed that uh, on your videos, sometimes you will use that tool and uh, show the audience how that that works. Um, That's fascinating that you can do that. Um, And uh, it is very impressive when you can actually see that thing work on your phone in the location that you're at. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I want to impress upon people is, look, here's what we're looking for. Here's what we found. Here's why we think it's significant. And and here are other things at that site that line up with that theory. Now, whether that theory is entirely true or not 
is it's that's still really what's up uh, for debate. Uh, and the, the archaeologists are, are kind of coming around slowly. There are some state archaeologists up here in the Northeast now that do recognize ceremonial stone landscapes. They do recognize that the stonework there is not typical with, with farm work or, or farm structures. Um, you know, a serpent wall, for instance. Sometimes they're only a couple hundred feet long, but they turn and meander for no apparent reason. And the argument would be made, oh, well, the farmer started to make a wall, but then didn't finish it. You could make that argument, but that doesn't explain why it has humps and it has beds and spins around. And that also doesn't explain all of the other stone features around it that are found as far away as Alaska or Peru. Why are they there? They weren't farming on top of a mountain in Alaska. They weren't farming on top of a mountain in Peru. Well, maybe they were. There is some evidence of that. But why are those structures there? What do they mean? I mean, we really have to start looking beyond that. And like I said, the archaeologists are starting to come around. Um, Connecticut, Ma uh, Rhode Island, they're coming around. Massachusetts seems to be just stuck in its ways. And, and that's very bad for what I'm doing, because that means that when one of these sites is called into question and maybe somebody wants to develop the land, that whatever feature is there is going to be gone forever. That's it. It's gone. And we'll never have the chance to investigate it, to document it, and the history of that place will be lost. Well, that brings up uh, the idea of uh, how, how you record your research. Is, is this something that you're able to preserve in some regards? So photos and videos are, are the best way. And I was just down at a site in Connecticut a couple weekends ago, and I had met with someone who's researching that site, has been for a few years, and I have a 360 camera, and I put the camera inside one of the stone chambers there, and he was like, wow, this, I, you know, taking a 360 photo, he's like, if anything ever happens, he's like, now we've got a record of exactly where that stone was, and, and how it was all put together. He's like, that's the only way to do it. That's the only way to get all the angles. And it had not really ever dawned on him before, uh, that that would be the way to do it. So, how old are 360 cameras? They're only a few years old. All these things that are, that are brand new. We've got, you know, I, I was looking, maybe get a new iPad the other day, and I, I don't know if I will or not, but uh, I don't know if the, the LiDAR that's in it is good enough to map the inside of a stone chamber, but that's what I'm looking at. Wow. That's new. Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, it's it's mind-boggling the things that we'd be able to do. I know that there are a couple of researchers out there with like thirty or eighty thousand dollar laser scanners, and they put out you know a hundred thousand points a second or five hundred thousand points a second or something ridiculous, and it it makes a, a 3D model of the structure. I mean, there are people out there doing that. I wish I had that kind of funding. Uh, it would make doing this a lot more fun. I mean, not that it isn't already, but like, man, if I had a 3D model or something at the end of the day, ah, I put that out there. Like, Michael, you'd be able to go into one of these stone chambers right there in Seattle. Maybe you put the little Oculus headset on and you got the, you know, the 3D model or my, maybe my 360 video and you go in there with us. That's where this is heading. You know, that's yeah. where. That's where I want to bring this, and, and that's the technology that's out there now. It just blows your mind. It absolutely blows your mind. And and I would encourage people to check out your your videos when you do use that that tool. That 360 degree camera is just amazing. Literally, your viewers can sit there and, like you said, almost with an Oculus headset on, but just looking at their phone. And doing that same thing and turning it around and seeing the... Di it's almost like we are there with you in your investigations. I just... I mean, talk about Indiana Jones. 
you know, and, and coming up with a film of this whole thing. Uh, I'm I'm really pleased that you're able to do that and be able to record for posterity what you're looking at. Yeah, when I post uh, a 360 bit, uh, when I post a 360 photo on Facebook and I share it around, I'll have hundreds of members join my group over a weekend or a weekend, um, and we're up to about 2,000 now. I I haven't put as much effort into growing the group as I could have been because I'm trying to get systems in place to do most of that grunt work for me. But, you know, like I said, these 360 photos, they're something else, and, and they really capture people's attention. It's one thing to have, like, a drone photo of something, and, you know, you're up in the sky, and it's a 360 photo, and you're looking around and everything. Like, that's cool. It's another thing when... These photographs take you inside a temple in Egypt or South America or Central America or to one of these stone chambers. They're simplistic it, comparatively, but to be inside of it and to see what it's like and to, to have that visualization for yourself is really something else. It's changing how we do this. Oh, yeah, it is, and that's the uh, idea of the project, I would imagine, is to get more and more people that kind of experience so that they uh, they can support what you do as well. Yeah, and, and it's not just the support in the traditional ways that people would think, but it's, it's the theoretical support behind it. As I stated at the beginning of the show, uh, and even into the middle of the show, the more I learned, the better of an eye that I had, the more I started to understand what these things might actually be. And the ideas that didn't hold so much weight that I believed for so long started to drop off. So I know people love mystery, and I know they're attracted to it. I totally get that. But do we want to perpetually live in that headspace? Do we want to always have things be a mystery? Or do we actually want answers? I don't know about the rest of you folks, but I want answers. And, and I want the right answers. I don't want some, some gibberish stuff that somebody made up 50 years, 70 years ago because they had no idea what they were looking at at the time. Yeah. And compared it to was all that they knew because that's all the information they could find. And when you have more eyeballs looking at what you uh, are sharing, uh, that, is yeah. inva that is invaluable. Because of people's different points of view, different uh, educational backgrounds they can bring to the table. For instance, one video that you had inside of this beautiful stone structure showed this rock with some dimples on it uh, and, and some, some coloring in, within the dimples that I looked at that and I'm going, Wow, that is fascinating. I would love to be able to, and I did. I paused your video, and I zoomed in just to get a good look at it. I mean, people are able to do that. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that you bring that up. Some people think it might be the Pleiades. It's the group of stars. Ah. And that, it's a very significant thing for the Native Americans. Um when the sun sets around a certain time, at the end of July, the beginning of August, um, there have been observations made that demarcate that particular date. Um, and even though the sun is setting in the western sky, if you turn your attention to about 68 degrees above the horizon, at about 50 or so degrees, depending on your latitude, um, I've seen it anywhere between like 50 and 58, I think. Uh, when you when you look at that point in the sky, which is like northeast, uh, east northeast, that's where the Pleiades start. The meteor shower starts to happen at that time of year, July, August, and it's very, very prominent um, at a, during maybe three days, I think, in August. Um, so, yeah. So that could be what that is and that's in the stone chamber who knows oh it's definitely uh something unique uh it almost reminds me that those dimples were filled in with some kind of ochre or something to to make them stand out 
you know um, um, it's fascinating and by the way the thing that's interesting to me is and maybe I could ask you this those structures seem to be so dark inside you've got artificial lights of course that you bring in to illuminate what's going on did you find that they were using some kind of illumination or torches or something like that in there no and i'm glad you brought up the aspect of light because i think the exact opposite of what you just said i don't think they brought light in there i'm starting to think that they made them to block whatever other light out that they could um some of these are aligned to some things or to some areas on the horizon that, that don't and it's not just on a random day it's on solstices so I can look at or I can if I'm in a structure that has let's say a, a, a winter solstice sunset alignment or a summer solstice sunset alignment um, and I look out and I look for that sun alignment with that app I can see that when I switch to a different app called Stellarium and I turn up the brightness of the Milky Way so I can see it and then I change the calendar to one of these solstice dates uh, we're using the example of uh, winter solstice sunset summer solstice sunset um, but it's also true for uh, I've seen winter solstice sunrises as well you'll see at a certain time during the night the Milky Way will rise out of the sky and it will come to a certain point where it will stand up straight in the sky. And that happens on the same day as the Milky Way. Now, I'm sure it's happening close to that on the days surrounding that, but it's very interesting that it would be there on that day. I mean, it's interesting and it's also not because the Milky Way is always out there and it's spinning around doing its thing. But it's interesting that you can get it to stand up that straight. If you looked at that same thing, uh, in maybe in April, it's probably like this. It doesn't go all that way up. It goes somewhere like that, okay? So, if you were trying to see the Milky Way, it's a very dim thing in the sky. Now, a lot of us can't see it nowadays because it's blocked out by light pollution. Um, you know that if you look out in the sky in the city in, or in the country. Two different, two different skies. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of light to block out back then. So I don't think that that was the particular purpose. I think it was to help your eyes adjust to the darkness so that you could let, your irises could let more light in. And I think it functioned very much like an aperture. I think they might be apertures. That's my, that's my going theory. Yeah. Oh, that is fascinating analysis. I like that. Um, here's a weird thing that uh, I just I'll throw out because I learned this on on spaced out Sunday uh, a guest of mine said that uh, you know the the eye patch for pirates yeah uh, literally had a, f a function it wasn't necessarily they are all one-eyed pirates uh, literally uh, when uh, they were for instance doing this they're navigating at night when they're going in and out of the bilge, you know, the actual under of the, of the ship of the craft and everything, uh, to make their eye be able to uh, adapt faster, they they put a patch over one eye so that they could immediately be able to uh, discern the difference between no light and sunlight and those kinds of things. I thought, oh my God, I had no idea that a patch like that could be functional. For some reason and now you're talking about an aperture and a structure that might be doing something very similar uh, to uh, societies way back oh that's I, I love that kind of stuff very cool I didn't know that about pirates I, I thought 
yeah, I, I was just kind of like one of those things you just never thought about, but that someone said that they were actually a tool that pirates used, not all the time, but it would be an eye patch that they could flip down if they needed to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sunlight's going to be so bright out on the ocean, there's nothing there to absorb it. It, it gets reflected back. It's going to be super bright. That makes total sense. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, when they go down under uh, uh, under deck, uh, they can see immediately. They don't have to worry about uh, their eyes getting used to that. And uh, that might be very handy in a, a ship that's being tossed on the sea, you know, or something like that. That's I just thought that was kind of cool. Fascinating stuff. Oh, my goodness. Well, we <laughs> this show is just flying by. We got one more segment left. And, and and you and I have done three solid hours already almost. Uh, so um, I'm really excited to get down to the bottom line here of some of the other things. If I know that there's stuff that you're probably wanting to make sure that we cover. Uh, so when we take this next uh, and final break of the show, uh, we will be thinking, or allow you to think anyway, of some of the things that we definitely want to make sure that we allow people uh, to understand about your work uh, you know, your upcoming uh, potential projects that you've got to share. Uh, so we will definitely be doing that soon, as soon as we get back from our next and last break here on Spaced Out Sunday. We'll be right back with Matt Adams. Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm Stacy Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, Stacy and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do, what to do. Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning Bumble. Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. So for more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Are you addicted to the woo? Good. Me too. This is Dave Scott, and you can woo it up with me every Monday through Friday, starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, for three hours of great entertainment in the subjects you love. UFOs, ghosts, cryptids, intuition, yes, we hit it all five days a week. Look for us at spacedoutradio.com, where together, my friends, we own the night. At spacedoutradio.com. We are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. 
Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Hello, everyone. This is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We're glad to team up with Spaced Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Spaced Out Radio website, and let's figure out what's going on together. Hey, Spaced Out Radio fans. It's John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head over to chivecharities.org and become a donor today. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. All right, we are back. Going down the final segment here, Spaced Out Sunday with our our good buddy Matt Adams. And we are learning a whole lot. You know, the first thing that I'm going to do, uh, Matt, I, I, as you know, I, I have a, a group called the UFO I Team, and we do sky watching, you know, for UFOs and interesting phenomena. Uh, but I never thought of the fact that, you know what, it could be interesting for us to download uh, the Sunseeker app uh, and the Stellarium app as well, um, it might come in handy for just certain, you know, kind of observations uh, when we're out there looking at the night sky as well. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I learned some new stuff, some new tools at least, and how you l- use them is fascinating to me as well. So. One of the first things I'm going to do is check out some of this technology that you're using. Yeah, the well, Larian's great. I had it out on my rooftop um, probably last week, and I'm like, that's Mars, that's Jupiter, that's Saturn, Venus, uh, I don't know where you are. So I pull out Stellarium, I'm looking, yep, okay, those are the planets. And then what I can't see is Neptune and Uranus. I'm like, oh, great. Well, now I know where they are in the sky. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, awesome. No, it's very helpful because uh, literally when you're, when you're doing sky watches, uh, from our perspective anyway, uh, you got to rule out all sorts of things. Uh, and, of course, as you know, a lot of folks are reporting UFOs that uh, are, you know, just misunidentified objects, you know, rather than something that... Uh, that is really a UAP. So it's always fun to, to make sure you have the tools out there that uh, that you can use to help kind of get down to the bottom line what the truth really is. But 
You know what? We need to make sure uh, that we are talking about the, some of the things that you might have not talked about yet that you want to make sure people realize about your work. Anything we haven't touched on so far? Well, I guess just sort of the, the overall direction of where I want to go with this. I talked a bit about the documentaries, and um, what I really want to do is document each site on its own, some sites have more than others. Some sites will be a full two hours or maybe even more. And other sites might have just a few minutes and they can be combined with other similar sites that only have a few minutes. So the final, uh, I guess, episode or documentary uh, will vary slightly in, in the result. But ultimately, that's what I'm looking to do. Uh, I'm putting systems in place to grow fan base to um, have a website that will host all of these things. Um, politically, I don't like the direction that I see things like YouTube and Patreon going in. Um, when those, And I've dealt with this before. I used to be uh, a concert promoter, and my main selling point was the venue. The venue was not under my control. And at a certain point, the venue pulled out from underneath me, and I had no festival anymore. So I'm very wary when it comes to putting uh, my company, my future, I'm self-employed, have been so for the past 14, 15 years. Um, I'm very cautious when it comes to putting anything of mine in somebody else's domain, in somebody else's castle. So I'm building my own castle. Um, you know, I'm, I'm building on social media, but I'm also building my own website, which, like I said, will house um, all of these things, the videos, the forum, the ability to, to upload information. Hopefully, we at some point, we can start sharing information. Um, that isn't the plans. I'm not quite sure the best way to do that yet. Um, we're looking at it, but that's one of the things. And then I know at some point, I've got a Kickstarter planned for... The, what will end up being probably the second season of documentaries. I would love to be able to be in a position first to launch the Kickstarter and immediately have, when it's over, immediately have something to deliver the people who just donated to the project. Um, so all of the first round of documentaries will go out after the Kickstarter. And then the funds that get raised... For that, uh, with that Kickstarter will be used to produce the second round or the second season of documentaries. Uh, it's a lot of work. Some of these sites you have to go to multiple years in a row. Um, there's two sites in Vermont that I've been to every year for the past three years, and I film more and more every time I go. Um, same thing with that Tripod Rock site in New Jersey. I've been there five or six times at different periods of, of the year, and I get more footage every time I go and I look and I find new things. Those things need to be researched out and included into the project somehow. So it's a lot of work and, and sometimes it's multi-year work. Uh, so it's not easy. And, and to be able to do that, we, we definitely do need some funding. So uh, it's all in the pipeline. The book is coming. Um, the Facebook group is going to grow. The YouTube channel is going to grow. I have actually hired business coaches to help me launch the Kickstarter to give me that direction. I've, launched, I've, I've hired another Facebook coach to help me learn how to run a group. I've hired a coach to help me uh, learn how to grow my YouTube channel. And finally, I've hired a coach to help me learn how to run ads on Facebook. So I'm educating myself on how to get all of this out there. And, and, and reach the, the most amount of people so that we can have the most amount of impact. Um, I really don't like that there are... Um, science is never settled, okay? But some things maybe um, we can get to that point, but not everything is. And science, as we've already discussed on this, on this interview, science can change. You know, with new tools and new ways of thinking that, that didn't exist and couldn't possibly have been conceived of. So, really, I want to develop something that will live on beyond me and will be a vehicle to get these sites the recognition that they that they need. 
uh, I recently did a video down in Rhode Island on on land that is about to be developed. It was never really researched. I reached out to the people that would have done it. They don't know. I reached out to the Rhode Island state archaeologist. She doesn't know. Nobody knows the stuff is there. It's going to be gone. And, and it's probably at the point now where it's too late to save that. But there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of cases that could be saved in the future with this knowledge with everything that we're put, trying to put together. And ultimately, that's the kind of impact that we want to have. Not to say that there can't be any new development, but to, to find a way to exist harmoniously with the past. That's really ultimately where I want this to go. And I want that to, like I said, live far beyond my, myself. Well, and I can see uh, your company and your strategies uh, being very helpful to municipalities and governments, local governments who are in that process of developing econom you know, economically and, you know, uh, you know, different things that are being taken and uh, changed as far as their landscape of their communities. But you can... You can preserve some information for them. You would think that your company would be very useful uh, for historical purposes and and scientific purposes, you know, before the development just overruns everything. Ultimately, that's why the book is free. I want to create a, a mass team of people who will go out and research this stuff on their own and submit their findings to grow this database so that things like that can be possible. We might start off with template letters that people can download, fill in the blanks, and then mail to their, their local town boards or their, their town council, whatever it is, and, and ha start having some kind of an impact, start educating the people who, who are in the office in their local town, and start changing these things and, and, or changing policies and trying to save these sites from being destroyed. Yeah. Um, oh, that would be very useful. And like you said, uh, the tools that you created, for instance, your book, uh, is going is going to multiply you and your knowledge uh, through, right. throughout uh, the local communities where people can pick up uh, the book and go, oh my gosh, I'm going to go check out this stuff in, our, in my neck of the woods. Uh, because it sounds significant to me now that I never knew uh, before. So that that's cool stuff that you're doing. Yeah, I can't wait to see the impact it has. <clears throat> that's what drives me, is, is knowing someday that this will have a, a very positive impact. Can't wait. And let's, uh, let's make sure that we um, promote the book again, uh, that give the title and, and how people could actually run across that uh, and when it might be released for folks. So the name of the book is Field uh, Field Guide to Investigating Field Guide to Investigating Stone Sites of the Northeast, um, and it will be free. Go to book.nessie.com. That's n e h s s i e dot com. Book.nessie.com. Enter your email there and. Right away, you'll be delivered to a free field report that um, I wrote up in April um, after the whole scandemic started. And uh, it, it, all of the investigation that I did from my desk uh, is in there, and it's about 35 or so pages. Um, and some of the lists earlier of criteria that we try to run these sites through, that's in there. You'll be able to read that, start getting into the mindset. Uh, you'll be able to see some of the uh, sun and, and possible moon and Milky Way alignments to that. And, and finally was able to, to see it and investigate it for myself. And based on what I saw there, I'm 100% convinced it's Native American now. Um, whereas in that report that you'll read, um, 
it was only a possibility. I was sort of equally weighing the two, and like I said, the stonework now has tipped me completely in the direction that that was a Native American structure. So that's where you can get the book. Okay. Uh, we we lost about 20 seconds of your explanation about the American uh, tribe there, but that's I think we got the gist of it. Uh, but let me ask you this. The, uh, the information in your manual now, would it be helpful for someone, for instance, in the Pacific Northwest where, where I'm at, even though they don't live in the, uh, the Northeast, I'm assuming some of the uh, techniques would be very useful for other people in different locations. So if you have any kind of stonework that's of mysterious origin out that way, um, I know that there are stone walls out in California that defy explanation. They're not farming walls, most likely. Um, that would be helpful in investigating those for sure. If there are, you know, what people refer to as stone carns or uh, what's now being termed as stone prayers, um, stone piles out that way, yeah, absolutely. This would help you investigate those as well. Okay, good. That's fascinating and good to know. Um, Boy, this is this has been a, a real eye opener for me uh, to the fact that uh, in reality we're we're probably uh, surrounded by information that uh, is generation and eons old that uh, we are oblivious of uh, as modern modern human beings. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said earlier. We, we just have delegated to somewhere else in society, and it's not in the forefront of our minds anymore. Um, not to say that it has to be, but again, for us to live harmoniously next to the past and, and respect it for what it is. And, and more than that, respect the people. Respect the people who were here and who are still here, really. They're still here. Um, respect them and, and give them, uh, you know, the, the the space in our minds, really, that they deserve. Yeah. You know, it, it occurred to me as well that uh, maybe the information that you're running across would dovetail, I don't know if it would, but dovetail with uh, ley lines and specific locations. Um, did you find... Any kind of correlation between uh, the astronaut, astrological and geographic positions with, uh, you know, the theories or the, the, the legends of ley lines and certain ceremonial spots, does that have anything to do with what uh, you've come across? So that's very interesting. Um, I've got planned for the docuseries, uh, there was one researcher who went out and mapped all of these strange uh, sort of either boulder placements or other type of, of stone structures um, over maybe four or five different towns. And his map, he, he went out for, I don't know, maybe two or three years and just mapped all those sites. And then, at one point, he started to draw lines and see if anything connected. Now, this blew me away when I saw this and started to understand his work. Um, when he connected lines, he had five pentagons, two large pentagons with smaller pentagons inside them, and then another pentagon off to the side. Now, I don't know if that's if that was by design or when I actually started to get out into the field and started to try to track all of these points on a map, like this was a USGS paper map from like 45 years ago, um, that I have to go out and map all of them again and find and get actual GPS coordinates. But when I started to get out there, I started seeing a whole bunch of stuff that wasn't on the map. So now I have to discern what exactly did he have on his map and what else is around there because if I don't mark everything that's around there and start noticing well why did he put this one specifically on the map and not these other things if I can't make that you know distinguish between them I'm not doing the thorough research that this that this needs so are there ley lines out there I don't know I'm 
I'm investigating that from from this 45 year old research that nobody ever bothered to check. And the guy put it out there; he wanted people to check it, but nobody ever did. So 45 years later, here I am. I've talked to him. I've had him on the phone. I've been out in the field chasing his old stuff down, calling him, saying, "Hey, uh, you got any memory of this?" And he really doesn't. But he's got boxes and boxes of research he hasn't looked at in 45 years. Oh, my. So, you know, that's all connected to lines. And, and maybe it's a thing. I don't know. But i got to chase this down and see if it is. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Uh, because then, uh, indeed, you, you've got to think for, for eons, for, for millennia, the people who have lived in these areas were tied to the land so thoroughly... Uh, there might be a reason why, you know, they ended up doing these megalithic structures in those locations, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, to line up with the winter or summer solstice. But it, it might all be uh, connected somehow. I mean, that's what I'm thinking. Now, I'm finding things are connected that I had no idea about. Yeah, and, and that very well may be the case. And I'll tell you, he's not the only one that has done that type of research. There was another guy down in New York. Um, he's probably 90 now. I was talking to him before all the, the, the you know, scandemic hit, but um, he's taken me out to a couple of sites. He showed me his research. He was a surveyor for 50 years, and that's what he did for work. And he went out and discovered a firelight system out in the, the mountains in southern New York, and it's like, that's insanity. What, so, what would that be? What is a firelight system? So essentially, it's it's uh, you know kind of a base camp type thing or like a, a small camp. Um, and when I say small camp, I mean like fireplace or, or you know not even a fireplace, but a place where you had a fire. Okay. Okay. And and, and those are on mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop over. I think it was like sixty miles. Oh oh. So one firelight goes on on one mountain, like the scene out of uh, Lord of the Rings, where they yeah. light the fires, and then the next mountain sees it, and they're like, ah, they freak out, and then they light the fire, and it just goes on and on. So he discovered that, and, you know, I think who made it might still be, you know, obviously in debate. Was it Native Americans? Was it um, surveyors that were out there late 1800s, early 1900s, when, when the big USGS project was going on um they went and they put like all these markers they surveyed all the mountains and all of that right um now we do that with google and satellites and lidar and all that stuff but you know that's how they did it in the old days and was this firelight system for the from those guys or, or does it predate that so i mean like the kind of research that's been done at just the two the last two cases that i talked about i mean there's there's hundreds of of sites that have that kind of research it's it just makes your head explode it's so much yeah and 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 you wonder uh whether those firelight uh you know locations were used maybe over and over again for thousands of years by different societies just because of the location and where they were that's interesting too right yeah very well could have happened very well could be the case well, Matt Adams, this has been a real pleasure. I tell you what, uh, I want to thank you for uh, really blessing my birthday. This is my birthday show. I really appreciate it. And uh, you just went the uh, the entire length of our three-hour pro uh, process here tonight on Spaced Out Sunday. Uh, and has been very, very helpful and uh, informative, I think, for, for all of us. So once again, let's let people know that website where they can find your stuff, your videos, and specifically that book that you're giving for free. That's awesome. So book.nessie.com. That's N-E-H-S-S-I-E.com. Book.nessie.com is where you can get the book. Hashtag Nessie on Facebook. You'll find the page in the group. Uh, the group is for everybody to share stuff and talk and discuss. And the page is just kind of where I post some news articles every once in a while or some photos, fun stuff. Hashtag us on YouTube. Find the channel. Um, it's it's Nessie on YouTube as well. Instagram, Pinterest, Gab. You can find me on Gab as Matt Adams. Gab.com. For all of you that are sick of Facebook, 
uh, put me in Facebook jail and, and delete your content, go to Gab.com. I fully support them. They've got my 100%. Good for you. All right. That's good to know, too, because, yeah, we got to have some alternatives out there for sure. Matt Adams, thank you again, buddy. I really appreciate it. We will have you back on when we can uh, get some more stuff out for you. Awesome. Great. And uh, happy birthday, Michael. Thank you so much for having me on and uh, helping you celebrate this special day. Thank oh, you. wonderful. Thank you, buddy. All right. Talk to you later. All right. Bye, Mike. Special thanks to everyone listening in at home, everyone. I want to thank uh, or remind you that Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Fall is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. And you can find out more information and his music at bumblefoot.com. A special thanks to everyone listening in at home and in your cars and at work and in the chat rooms tonight, wherever you are around the world. Remember, the show is currently copyrighted by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures. Thank you for sharing our, your evening with us. Because together, my friends, we own the night. Good night, everyone. We'll talk to you next Sunday.